All right, and we're live. Welcome everybody to another Mantis Meat live stream. We're so excited to have you. Uh, I'm excited today. Today we're going to talk about a topic that a lot of people ask uh, us, the team, about on Man in Mantis Meat, and I have a fantastic guest with me today. Uh, as as you all know, I'm Ben. I'm one of the uh, admins of the Mantis Meat group. Also, I I run Jack's Mantis. But today we have with us Bruno from Let Me Bug You, mainly on Instagram, and uh, I'm very excited to have him as part of this live stream today because you can tell his love for his animals and his work through his when you follow his work on Instagram and to the little time that I've known him he's really been a really cool and nice guy so again uh, welcome Bruno thank you for joining us how are you doing today I'm doing great thank you very much for your uh, for having me today and uh, I'm really excited to talk about uh, this topic because it's something that uh, most beginners don't really uh, yeah, like there's no, not that much information out there about, uh, what is a good beginner mantis, you know? So it's always good to have, uh, people who have experience with this to help out. Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, especially people who've been experienced with mantis are probably going to say, oh, this is easy because they've kept it and been used to it, but they don't know there's some limitations to somebody who is literally just getting into the hobby. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, uh, you probably some of you don't know, but Bruno's from uh, he's uh, coming live from Spain, so it's it's midnight there. So, so thank you. But we're gonna let Bruno kind of tell us how we got him to mantises and kind of what draws him towards them as, as an animal to keep and breed and, and observe and photograph. Bruno, okay, so yeah, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Um, I'm kind of a mix, I was born in the US, but uh, my parents are Brazilian and I've been living in Spain for, for quite long. So uh, my passion for insects has been there since I was like a kid, a three-year-old kid. Uh, it, it's a funny story because um, when I was uh, a kid, uh, my mom, she would usually uh, try to calm me down, you know, when I was like crying or something. She, she, there was one day that she didn't know what to do and she put a little insect on the table to see what was my reaction, you know. So, I suddenly stopped crying, you know, and I just started to follow the, the bug with my finger. So after that, she she probably thought, oh, okay, this works. So I'm just going to put a little bug there on top of the table and he's quiet. <laughs> so uh, since then, she kept doing this and my passion evolved into a more in-depth love uh, for invertebrates until today which um it's uh my passion and i'm trying to make it uh my full-time business uh d did your mom ever regret it because like you start bringing in cockroaches and stuff or <laughs> something like that <laughs> yeah that part uh, i i think she did regret it a little bit but she understands me and she always understood me and she always supported me so i'm grateful for that okay awesome well again thank you for joining us bruno so we're gonna jump uh it's going to be a pretty casual conversation today, folks. I'm going to put some slides up there of pictures of the mantises, then I'll just take them off so we can continue our discussion, just so you have an idea of what mantises we're talking about. And then uh, either of us will lead on a particular species, but then, of course, we'll both be chiming in. And then, like all live streams towards the end, we'll have a uh, Q&A session. So for the first mantis, and we're going to start today by going... Uh, kind of from sizes we're going to go from small medium to large uh, i just think that's the best way to start it another very important thing i want to put out there this is the internet everybody has their own opinion as to what the best beginner mantis is blah 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 etc this is just my own personal and bruno we got together we talked about what we, what we thought are the best beginner mantises i'm sure there are uh, you know are others but uh uh we're going to explain here in a second why we chose these species uh okay and then also know that there's I personally think there's more than just three levels. Usually people say there's beginner, uh, intermediate, and advanced. For mantises, because so much so many of them are actually pretty easy, I feel like there's a beginner and a beginner plus, intermediate and then advanced. And the reason I want to make probably in the future a beginner plus live stream is because the mantises that we're going to showcase and talk about today, I, I imagine a brand new keeper who who has done minimal to no research on mantises can pick these up for the most part and succeed with them. 
I'm not saying that's don't do that. Do your research whenever you're getting an animal. Mm -hmm. But this is the point of this live stream is these are the kind of matches that are so hardy, so easy that even somebody who has done no research can pick them up and really, uh, you know, make them thrive and, and have a successful uh, keeping experience with them. OK, so the criteria by which we chose uh, what defines a beginner mantis is uh, no special environmental needs. So basically, you get the mantis. You don't have to get any additional heating pads, uh, you know, nothing, no uh, humidifiers, nothing like that. Uh, this is assuming you don't live in a, in a place that has extreme temperatures and you don't have climate control. So you might have to factor that in. Uh, no special feeder requirements. That's pretty self-explanatory. You should be able to keep them and raise them successfully without going out of your way to look for insects that are hard to come by or very specific. Uh, also, no special housing requirements. So again, as long as you meet the general uh, basic mantis rules for uh, enclosures, which uh, as many of you should know is uh, three times the length of the mantis high and two times uh, uh, deep and wide. Okay. So, the and then factor, actually. was that Bruno? Sorry. I think that's the most important factor actually when you're choosing a, a mantis to know exactly um, how you're going to house it because um, it really influences the mantis in, in the sense that it has, it needs space to molt, you know, and that's one of the most crucial moments in, in their uh, life cycle, you know. So if, if you screw that up, then it's hard to go back. Yeah, and, and you and that's you brought up a good point, Bruno. Like it, mantis is are really easy to keep. The only issue is the molting. The molting is the most sensitive period for the mantis, and it's learning about catching these signs and stuff about when they're about to molt. And that you know that's kind of what helps you become successful. And another thing to the housing, uh, it's that's not the dimensions of the enclosure. That's the amount of free space you should have for the mantis. So if you get an enclosure that meets those dimensions, dimensions, and then you just fill it with a bunch of fake plants and sticks and too much of that stuff, too much busyness, it can actually affect the mantis when it's molting by not giving enough room to drop no. down vertically. Yeah. So, no crowding cause... yeah, so that's very important. Um, another fact: the other factors are easy to find or obtain. Um, you know, there are rare or uncommon species that are actually very easy to keep but you know if, if you can barely find them or never even get them what's the point of mentioning them so we obviously have ones that are easy to keep and uh you know bruno will talk a little bit more of what's more available in europe and i'll be covering more of the u.s side uh, affordable obviously so if you're a beginner you're just getting into the hobby or i'm sure there's a lot of you here in the group who say you love mattresses and you haven't gotten it yet uh, you know we want it to be affordable obviously maybe it doesn't work out for you but at least something that's affordable so you can give it a shot you know and, and then, yeah. I actually, sorry Ben, I, I actually noticed uh, this last year uh, there are much more species available in the U.S. than previous yeah. years. Just my, yeah. my, no, you're absolutely right. Even from somebody outside of the U.S., I can tell you as, you know, from my from my side, it is definitely exploded. The hobby has grown. It just, in the, yeah, yeah, I'm going on my fourth year. It's, it's insane how much it's grown. Even people that have been in way longer than I have have said the exact same thing. So, you, I mean, you definitely got it there. You're right. No, uh, so there's so, yeah. the people that uh, probably didn't previously have interest in this. Uh, they're just open to, to learn about this. You know, I, I don't know if it was um, because of the confinement, because of COVID and all that. People were stuck in their houses and playing with their phones during more time and probably had more time to go through Instagram or Facebook or whatever and saw mm, many of these uh, posts and start to, I, I think that's probably a reason. Yeah. A few of us keepers have had this discussion. We think it's a like a, a mix of factors, obviously like, you know, COVID uh, with everybody being indoors, uh, yeah. TikTok was huge. A lot of big mantis influencers or whatever on TikTok became big. Um, you also have, uh, Animal Crossing. S some people say that might be a big, you know, that came out and you can catch some mantises in there, including the orchid mantis. So, so you know, I think a, a combination of all those factors kind of led to a, a massive boom in the hobby. So I actually don't know what is uh, this mantis crossing about. Oh, Animal Crossing. It's a video game on uh, Nintendo Switch. So, but in there, yeah, you capture like different different uh, insects, and among them, you could, there's like there's like your traditional green looking mantis okay. and an orchid mantis, and you can catch them. You can like display them. And stuff so and that game is very popular so uh, i can imagine that had some something that people probably wanted hmm, i wonder if you can actually keep a real mantis so <laughs> so and then um 
So, and then lastly, hardy and resilient. Uh, these are mantises, you know, they, they can take a beating. Uh, whether you forget them uh, for a few days or your your uh, your AC was a little bit too low or something like that, they can handle it for, you know, within a reasonable uh, time frame. Uh, yeah, any kind of, extreme yeah, conditions. yeah, like, yeah, exactly. So, again, not too much, but they can, ha they can take a beating. And, you know, these are mantises that sometimes I've heard stories of people like, leaving a ghost mantis nymph on the shelf somewhere they forgot it for like a month and a half and it just didn't eat or drink and it was perfectly fine <laughs> when they found it you know so it, you know lived in, in to, to an adult so the, that's that's yeah a very important part of that yet so do you want to say something about about that bruno no i, I said I, i'm guilty to do that <laughs> You're, yeah it happens when you have hundreds and thousands of mantises yeah, yeah. it's gonna happen it's unfortunate but, but she was yeah. fine in the end so yeah. <laughs> So those, those are the criteria that we're using today to define the beginner mantis. Now, we're just going to go ahead and jump into species, starting from the small ones, medium, and then large. Okay, so the first one we got is the Crea broter. And I think, Bruno, are you going to take it from here? Yeah, sure. So um, I believe this is probably the one of the prettiest uh, beginner mantises for obvious reasons. Uh, their threat display is just amazing. They have these purple and black colored inner wings and plus they have a really aggressive behavior for their size which in turn helps a lot in the in the part of uh, feeding them you know because they're not uh, skittish and they, they don't run away so they, they'll just tackle anything they they get their eyes on you know so I also recommend them because uh, they are pretty adaptable uh, in the in the housing requirements, especially. They will adapt well to a, a really basic setup, as well as a planted mini terrarium, you know. So, and also humidity-wise, for example, they are pretty tolerable. They they will need a little bit more humidity than uh, other species, like for example, ghost mantises. These guys, they'll tolerate like almost uh, no spraying, you know, but uh, Cree butter, they'll probably need a little bit more humidity to thrive. But I think overall, it's one of the best beginner species. Yeah, and I agree completely with them. Uh, these are one of the first ones I got too when I got into the hobby. And like Bruno said, they're just, they're incredible. They'll take on a, like we give, we get wowed when a when a big mantis takes on a big prey item, but you gotta look at it proportionally. Like a Creobrotus species can take a pretty big size prey item when you compare it to a larger species that even they sometimes can't. So they're they're very incredible. Uh, like Bruno said, they they come from tropical areas, so they prefer higher humidity. But again, if you feed them properly, like your feeders are well hydrated and you miss them regularly, That's they cool. last. Yeah, they're they're fantastic. They last just fine. Uh, the Creobrocha species, there's several different species in this genus that are available in the hobby. Uh, the main one is Gamatus. Uh, you know, again, Bruno, pitch in what you, what you know from um, from the European side of things, but there's Gamatus, there's Pictopinus, and Urbanus. I think those are the main three. Yeah. With and... with Pictopinus and Urbanus being a little bit more uh, uncommon, so you're most likely gonna have a Gamatus. So. Yeah, Gamatus is, is uh, probably the most commonly available. Um, my strand comes from. A southern part in China, which is called the mm. uh, Yunnan province, and I'm not really sure of what species it is, um, but it, it's yeah. actually the size of Helvia. I mean, it's it's like huge. It's yeah, yeah. Huge. exactly. When I saw it, I think uh, Ennis Ennis Faye had them first or something, but uh, right. I definitely noticed they're they're way bigger than your regular Korea broters. So that's that's that has to be a different species that we haven't figured out yet. So, mm. uh, but I'm actually excited to see those as they develop because they, I, you know. A bigger Creo Broto, that's awesome. You know, that's, yeah. <laughs> I'll take it any day. <laughs> so it's fantastic. And again, the great thing about these, uh, you can keep these in a 24 ounce cup their entire life. I don't know what a 24 ounce cup right, equivalent is uh, in Europe, but it's it's smaller than your regular 32 ounce. It's, yeah, I think it's if a you have, bigger cup, maybe. A, a what? Sorry? Ice, maybe. No, no, no. Smaller than that. Yeah, I'm talking about like, so. So this would be your like a regular thirty-two ounce. It's like even less, a twenty-four ounce. Maybe They're even smaller than that. If you want to, I'm saying, if you live in a condo or a studio and you have literally just a shelf, you can easily have 
four, five, six of these species in little cups. You can make them look however you want, as long as they you know meet the housing requirements, and they'll do just fine. So they're, they're wonderful. Yeah. Ready to move on to the next one, Bruno? Or do you have anything, anything else to say about this? Oops. Okay, I'll take it. We're good. So next species will be Theopropus species, and uh, Bruno will lead on this as well. Okay. So uh, I like to call this, uh, uh, it's, it's not a totally beginner uh, species in the sense that uh, in terms of care and housing, it does meet the requirements for, for to be cataloged as a beginner mantis. Um, but when it comes to breeding, that's a different story because uh, their sexual dimorphism is really uh, apparent. So they are kind of tough to, to pair. But if we're talking about uh, overall care and, and housing, they're, they're probably the same as Creobora and humidity-wise as well. They're pretty hardy. They'll tackle. They're, they're a bit more skittish than uh, Creobora, but they, they will tackle big prey. They prefer especially flying prey, which is a, uh, an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, because they, they tend to like to hang on to the leaves and, and top uh, foliage of, of the enclosure or even in the ceiling on the mesh. So uh, you don't want to just throw in crickets or, or red runners, for example, and just wait for her to, to go. Because they, they're more of a, a sit and wait predator, you know. In comparison to Cree Birder, the, these guys, the Cree Birder just goes straight to the kill, you know. These guys are, are more patient, you know, they wait for something to fly by and then they catch it. So it's always good. Uh, if you want to feed them other feeders that are not flying prey, it's good that the feeder has the ability to climb the wall so it comes near it, you know, or you can also feed it with the thumbs. With, with the thumbs. Yeah. And, and I was going to say that because uh, as many people know, I'm a, I'm not necessarily, uh, I use crickets as my main feeder after fruit flies for most of my species. Uh, I do change it up. I keep a lot of different, but the main staple feeder is crickets. And like you said, uh, the, the thing that helps me is all my enclosures have some kind of climbable side to, to, to them. So even if they're hanging up top, the cricket is always going to, they're very fast and like to move around, which is perfect. You know, it draws their attention. Uh, but yeah, if you can keep flying prey, that works perfectly fine as well. But if you're going to use crickets or red roaches, like you said, uh, red runners, make sure you have a surface or you know side of the enclosure that it has kind of some kind of material that they can easily grasp and climb up. Uh, but I've had my my theopropers do perfectly fine with crickets. So, yeah. uh, but it, as you know, obviously keep them clean like like all feeders. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, they're they, yeah. yeah what, sorry, go on. Yeah, that, that's what I was. Uh, I wanted to talk about. It's really important to keep your feeders clean at all times because. Uh, especially crickets, they'll develop uh, gut bacteria really easily because they they'll eat anything. You know, even their 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 counterparts. You know, yeah. If, if they have a lack of food, so um, they can get pretty dirty very fast, and that will be detrimental for the mantis in turn when she eats a cricket because she's going to ingest a lot of bacteria, and that's uh, in my experience, I had so many deaths. Uh, happen because of that because I fed them uh, either dirty feeders or feeders that have eaten other dead uh, insects, dead crickets inside the box. You know, so it's an important. And thing. I think uh, in Europe, you guys have a species of cricket that's uh, like especially not good for mantises. I think it's like black cricket or something. I forgot yeah, what it's called. Reasons, uh, yeah. yeah, those are not good. Uh, the crickets I have, they're called uh, banded crickets. Actually, that's fine. Banded flower, mantis, banded crickets, uh, but they're, they're actually very good. They're they're pretty clean. They you know they're very hardy. So uh, I, yeah, I think I think I heard a lot of problems with that that specific species of cricket that that Europe had for a while. I don't yeah. know if they still do, but it's like black a black cricket or something like that. So I'm sure somebody yeah, will type yeah. in the chat later. And I'll, they're they're also very nippy. So uh, you probably want to feed these. If, if you have no other option, you probably want to feed these to a bigger species like a Hyrodula or, or a Bombardier that can easily just like overpower because um, they have pretty strong mandibles and you don't want to 
uh, risk uh, an injury to your mantis. Yeah. And so, and back to the another thing you mentioned about the theopropis is uh, there is quite a stark sexual dimorphism. So yeah. the, the males are tiny. So yeah. adorable, adorable, but super, super tiny. Yeah. And the females are actually pretty good size. The females are bigger than the Korea uh, yeah. The Korea uh, jeweled flower mantises. You can tell the difference between male and female, but the sexual dimorphism is not that stark. But with the banded flower mantis, um, <laughs> uh, I had a person, actually, she's one of her photos is here. Her name is Nicole. She sent me her female, and I had a male. And when my male matured, I was like, this can't be it. This was my first time keeping it. I was like, holy crap, they're so small. They're so yeah, tiny. They're not like yeah. different species. <laughs> if you're not, <laughs> it really, I mean. Yeah, it's, 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 it's honestly, it's comical. It's, it's like seeing an orchid. But they're even smaller, you know. Like the or, you know, sexual dimorphism of the orchid is pretty stark too. But when you see it on even a smaller scale, it's just it's hilarious. Yeah. So moving on to the next uh, small species is going to be the uh, I've actually never pronounced this uh, out loud. Yes, I mean, but it's, yeah, I think it's Galinthius. I mean, I've kept them a couple times. Um, I no longer will keep them, not because they're hard. Because they are this one of the zippiest mantises. So if you like to handle your mantis, this might not be the one you want. But if like I'm more of an observe kind of keeper, I love to keep them and look at them. They're great. They're again another flower species. Uh, they look a lot more beautiful as nymphs. For some reason, when they get an adult, they have kind of like your traditional mantis look a little bit uh, in terms of coloration, except for the pronotum has a, a bit of it, uh, a bit of like a pattern, and their uh, and their raptors too. But they have plain. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm actually learning from this because I, I never owned the species, so it's pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, and you know, these are even smaller than the Korea brochure, I think. So again, if you have a shelf in a studio and you want to keep mantises, you can keep easily half a dozen of these, no problem. Uh, again, like I said before, they're pretty zippy, so just make sure you're in an enclosed area if you want to handle them. Uh, have small feeder items. So, so these last three species we mentioned. You're gonna need smaller feeder items. Usually, everybody uses fruit flies for all species and when they're when they're first insect. Almost all, not not everyone, but these can easily eat high di for, and probably until pre sub sub adult. Uh, if we're talking about similar to Cree brochure size, right, Bruno? Yeah. Um, how how big are they actually? The these, these are a little bit smaller than Cree brochure, but but yeah. about similar, but a little, just a tiny bit smaller. Right. Yeah, Cree brochure is like four. Mm, five-ish four four centimeters and a half for females and uh males are actually almost the same size so. yeah but if you have enough uh, uh Drosoph drosophila hydei fruit flies yeah. you can feed that to them for for a while before you need to move to anything bigger so again they can take larger prey items uh, they can a, a third like a fourth instar galinthius or any of the ones we just mentioned can easily take like a house fly or maybe even a, i've even seen Blue bottle flies be taken at that age. What, what uh, is that, that eating there? What, what is that one eating on the picture? Uh, that's a that's a picture from Voitja. I think it's a. I can't really tell. It looks like a cricket. Yeah. <laughs> so, but Voitja is very. He's one of the moderators too uh, of of the group, and he's he's quite experienced. He's a young guy, but very very knowledgeable and experienced. So, I'm sure he knows what he's doing. But this is again another great species. Uh, this is not always available. But they're available enough. I see them coming like waves, kind of. Whereas like Creo Brotor, mm. you just they're always around. The Opropus have just recently become a lot more available, but since they've been introduced, I don't think I've seen them out of the hobby yet for I think a couple of years uh, at least. So you should be okay with going for the Theopropus. Uh what about Europe, Bruno? What do you what do you have over there in terms of these three, um, three ones we mentioned? What's the most available probably? The most available of the species you were talking about, you mean? Yeah, these three small ones, yeah. Uh, I would say Korea Broder. I mean, between Korea Broder and uh, Ghost Mantis. Ghost Mantis is probably the most yeah. common. <laughs> you know? But after that, it's Korea Broder, for sure. I heard, I heard in Southern U Europe, you can probably even find them in the wild. I've heard they've actually moved up. They've probably migrated from I've Africa. Is that, is that, have you heard that? On the internet. But I'm not sure about that. I'm actually not yeah. sure about, about that information. If, if it's um, true or not, uh, I, it will be really interesting uh, to have like a confirmation, like a picture confirmation of uh, the fact that ghost mantises have adapted to uh, Southern Europe climate. You know, that, that will be really interesting. 
Yeah, because the ghost mass is endemic to all of Africa and Madagascar. I mean, it's they're all over the place. So, you know, obviously, uh, I've been to you know Europe, and I, I used to live on the Mediterranean. I've, I've traveled to the north North Africa, and the, you know the Mediterranean climate is relatively similar for the most part. You know what I'm saying? So I wouldn't be surprised if you know Southern Spain climate is like Southern Africa climate. You know, yeah, really mild winters and really hot summers. Okay, yeah, but you're in North Spain. Right, you're in Barcelona. Uh, yeah. North east. Northeast, kind of, yeah. Yeah. No, sorry. Okay. North. No, yeah, northeast. Yeah, yeah. northeast. Yeah. Northeast. So you won't you won't be finding any ghost mans this soon. No, unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now we're gonna move on to the medium sized mantises. So we, we're done with the small. Let's go with the medium now. And I, we already just mentioned it. Bam, baby. It's, this is one of the best. This is the ghost mantis, yeah, Philocrania paradoxa, uh, and uh, eludens. I just want to make sure I point this out before Bruno takes it over. Uh, <laughs> these are not two separate species. Uh, they're most likely different localities, but they can interbreed, and they're considered synonyms. But as good practice in the hobby, if you do have an eludens, you want to yeah. kind of keep them, yeah, yes, breed mm -hmm. them with other eludens because they, they do have a bit of a different crown structure. Uh, they look a little bit different. You want to keep that to kind of have Know, to those two different looks if Absolutely. you do have hybrids which i have i have had hybrids before mm -hmm. uh, make sure you let people know when you have hybrids uh, right so it, it's, and, it's good uh, breeding practice yeah go. um when when you have when you pair the hybrids do, do you get like mixed uh nymphs with with the uh, eludens morphology and the paradoxon Morphology or I, I, yeah, so I I just saw basically mainly that it, it seems like the paradoxa genes are the dominant ones. Okay. So I think I know slightly slightly slimmer uh, crowns. It, I, you know, it's been a little bit since I had those hybrids. But if I'm not mistaken, so don't don't quote me for sure 100. But if I'm if I'm not mistaken, the crowns were a little bit thinner, uh, so it was a little bit harder to sex them when they were younger. Okay. Uh, but for the most part. They retain the same crown shape that you know that we use to distinguish male and female ghost mantis. Uh, so, but definitely, I personally like the paradoxical crown. It's it's just thicker. I like that thicker look on it. It looks like they actually have something. Whereas the uh, eludens is kind of like a you know a, a lot more narrow and kind of twisty. Yeah. I mean, it's still cool. You know, so, but you gotta admit the eludens shield is much wider. It's Maybe. Yeah, I've actually never had a, a full eludin, so I couldn't tell you. But you know, with the hybrids, I didn't really notice that. Again, maybe I didn't pay attention hard enough, but I didn't really notice it. But yeah, you definitely, you definitely want to keep them separate if you can. I mean, you know, exactly. and if you do have hybrids, let people know. If you, especially if you're trying to do a breeding collab, uh, it's it's just good breeder practice. You know, yeah, it's, there's it's, a lot of confusion if you don't uh, keep that clear. Cause uh, normally, people. I mean, when you Google eludens in, in the inter internet, you, you're gonna see a picture of the typical eludens with a really thin uh, head protrusion, you know. And uh, if you're selling your hybrids as uh, paradoxa, and then the customer gets, like, for example, uh, a paradoxa. Uh, I mean, an eludens with a, with a paradoxa similar crown. Uh, that might generate some uh, misunderstanding. Confusion, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, it's just it's just the proper courteous thing to do as as, mm -hmm. as a keeper and a breeder. If you you're trying to help spread the species and maintain them and conserve them, you want to make sure you're giving people the right information. I mean, it's it's just the right thing to do. So make sure you're doing that. Uh, what else you guys say about the ghosts, man? There's you know, you don't have to go too much, but I mean, they're just. The ghosts. Man, but uh, I would say, um, personally, they're one of my favorites. I mean, they're even rare mantises that don't even come close to their unique morphology. I mean, they perfectly mimic a dead leaf, you know, and it's amazing how they already at first instar, they sway, you know, to mimic the, the leaves in the wind. Mm -hmm. And... With other species, it takes time to develop, but ghosts, they, they just do it right away, you know. You can always see the cryptic behavior right away after they're born. So uh, I also believe that they are probably one of the best 
beginner mantises to keep because they're long lived. Uh, they will also pair easily and they also will adapt to a variety of prey items and housing requirements as, as you said, Ben. Uh, they are really flexible in that aspect and also humidity requirements since they come from different parts of Africa uh, they can tolerate periods of drought and periods of extreme humidity you know, so yeah, it's a they're incredible they really are incredible yeah it's the one it's, it's the one beginner mantis I feel like I always need to have in my collection it's yeah. it's a must. I just yeah, it's a must. I, I don't care how advanced I become or something. I, I always want to have ghost mantises. They're just so cool. Um, you can keep them. Again, and I always have to put a disclaimer. There's no such thing as a, as far as I understand or know of, maybe there is a completely communal mantis, but there there's no, you know, effectively speaking or virtually, there is no communal mantis. They're all solitary. I, I don't think there's a species that I'm aware of yet that you find in the wild that congregate together yeah, other than, you know, other than two or three coming to mate. They, they don't have such an aggressive behavior, for example, but um, they're not communal as uh, like natural behavior. They're not communal, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you can keep them communally, uh, given enough space and food, and they're like, it, and there's a golden rule for communal keeping. It, don't keep any mantises communally that you're not willing to lose. I think if you follow that, Bruno, I don't know if you agree with that, if, yeah. you follow, if you follow that, you'll you'll be fine because you'll be expecting potential losses, uh, you know. So yeah, that's the, yeah. The, but ghosts are yeah. You gotta keep in mind that if if you keep mantises communally, um, you have to accept the probability that um, you may you may have some losses, you know, because it's not guaranteed that they will um, not attack each other. So. It's important to have a lot of space and a lot of food available. Exactly. And uh, also separating by sex and instar helps too. Uh, but yeah, definitely space and food. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, you don't, don't get distracted. <laughs> When's your we are very <laughs> yeah, our audience is very, uh, they like to distract a lot. I know that, but uh, <laughs> stay focused. But yeah, so again, back to, uh, to the yeah. ghost. I just want to tell people also another amazing thing about this species is they have a variety of colors. So the females especially, uh, they can go from as you can see on the on the on my PowerPoint slide here that they, they can come like a light brown, a greenish brown. They can come. I've seen some like almost almost jet black. They're gorgeous. Yeah, they are um, amazing. I never had the chance to yeah. have this. But yeah, yeah I, I, that's the one I've always wanted a, a, a like a dark black uh, ghost mantis. I man. Yeah. What would I? feel is well uh based on my experience um there's people that say if you increase humidity they'll uh in subsequent molds they'll grow greener you know and with a drier environment they'll go to, to more drier colors you know but what i've noticed is uh that if you, if you put them in a well planted enclosure with a lot of green around them they will also turn green, even if you don't uh, spray them as much or increase their humidity in the, in the enclosure as much. But that's an important. Uh, thing. I, by the way, sorry, Dylan. I think the stream cut off there for about for about ten seconds. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, can oh, you see that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I had some connection issues there. Uh, where did I stop? I, I don't know. We just kind. Of, I think before you start talking about the colorations. Okay. Well, okay. I'll go through that again. So. Um, I find interesting that some people say that uh, to have uh, the green color more, you have to increase humidity, you know. Uh, but what I found with my own experience is that it doesn't matter if you increase humidity or not. Um, if you keep them in a well-planted terrain with a lot of green around them, they will also quickly adapt to that. And in subsequent modes, they will get greener. You know, because yeah. um, what I found is that if, if you put them in a darker area with uh, like brown foliage, they will adapt to that independently of their humidity. 
they have uh, on being closed. Yeah, and you know that's that's been a subject of debate quite a bit in the in the groups yeah. for for a while now. Uh, yes. People would say, "Oh yeah, just do this." And you know, as somebody who keeps them all, uh, some people know my setups. Actually, I have one right here. My setup is like this for all my mantises. It's the exact same, and I get a variety of colors. Why? I don't know. It seems like genetic variation uh, variants. It does yeah. seem like there might be some environmental factors. Actually, uh, there's a person named Cora uh, Cora Dart. I don't know if anybody's. Uh, she's she's become more popular in the group, but she was very big in the in the mantid forums online, and she's doing an, actually an experiment. She has a website. I'm actually planning on possibly doing with her a a, a live stream just for ghost mantises. She's like a young mantis superstar, but she has uh, she has a lot of ghost mantises right now, Bruno. She's doing that experiment right now. She's keeping them different humidity, different uh, like she's doing a proper scientifically oriented experiment okay. you know not yeah. just you know so yeah with, so with keep, keep, keep. data that, yeah that's interesting i am I'm, yeah. I'm really interested to see what what's, what comes out of it yeah I, so so are we so uh but cora cora dart okay you'll see you'll see her around cool but uh yeah so ghost mantis is bam i think that's that's it by the way this is one of the few uh, species uh, and bruno tell me what you think one of the few species i think the males are more fabulous looking than the females i just think they're, they're great. They have nice feathery antenna. They have like a, a, a nice jagged crown. They have this beautiful, uh, very elegant long wings. Much more beautiful than females. But um, yeah. I also really like females when they're nymphs. You know, they have that wide abdomen that like moves like a leaf. You know, mm -hmm. it's really cool. And yeah, overall, sexual dimorphism in, in paradoxes is not that uh, pronounced. I mean, in terms of size, of course. Yeah, but yeah. Probably, yes. But yeah, I have to agree with you that their crown is just amazing, the males. Yeah, as adults. <laughs> as, but like you said, nymphs, they're about the same. You can yeah, I can see why you prefer the females, but as adults, the male is much more spectacular. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's it for the ghosts. And just, again, probably this is, if, again, if, if I had to put my stamp on the best beginner mantis is going to be the ghost mantis. Because again, you can also, you can keep these as an adult in a 32 ounce container. I would personally put them something a little bit bigger when they become adult. Bigger is always could. better. Yeah, bigger is always better. Uh, for not, well, depend how big, so. Huh? <laughs> Depends how big. But you know, definitely, definitely, yeah, something a little bit bigger than the 32 ounces uh, as an adult would be nice for them. Uh, but technically, if you're short on space or something happened in an emergency situation, They'll do fine in the 32 ounce. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's it for the Ghost Mantis. So uh, ready for the next one, Bruno? Yeah, that's cool. All right. Next one is uh, is one of my personal favorites. And my first species, the Budwing Mantis. I couldn't have these, experience with these. So. Yeah, it's a shame. You should, because uh, I don't think the photos do them justice, Bruno. But when you yeah. when you look at them up close, actually, they have these. It was my first Mantis, actually, that, that I bought from an expo, you know, before Ghost Mantis. So, yeah, yeah. This yeah, this yeah. upper right photo of of uh, the male eating uh, I think I think it's a fly yeah. dipped in pollen. Yeah, that was my first mantis. His name was Jorge. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my first mantis, and it was a budwing. And I actually sent that mantis to Cora Dart, who I just talked about with the ghost. So I actually sent her that mantis. When was your first mantis? How long ago? What was it? No, how, how long ago was your first mantis? So it was like three, three, three years and, and some change. So I'm going on my fourth year of keeping now. So so it's yeah, it's about a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So but yeah, awesome. They're fantastic. So as as nymphs, uh, males are still aggressive as adults. They'll eat. I mean, you know, there's a general rule whenever a mantis male becomes an adult. Generally speaking, they eat less. Okay, uh, and this this does apply to budwing. They will eat more than other male species. Uh, that's probably something we didn't mention, Bruno. Adult male ghosts barely eat. You might good. give, yeah, an adult male ghost might eat two half bottle flies. And I say that because. Whoops. Internet. Because you might give it a bottle I lost you there. I lost you there. Sorry. Yeah, so what I was saying is uh, that the male uh, budwing doesn't eat as much, obviously, when he becomes an adult. Okay. And I was kind of comparing it to the to the ghost mantis, yeah, where right. the adult male ghost mantis barely eats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So probably like acanthops males. These guys, they probably eat one meal and after the adult and mate and bye bye. You know. Yeah, yeah. But again, they're, they're, the the budwings are not that bad as adults. They will eat just just 
just expect a little bit less. And I just say that because there's a picture of Jorge there eating. So, but as nymphs and the females, oh boy, do they eat? They eat <laughs> and they eat, and they're 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 a medium sized species, and they're not relatively bulky, but Man, those those female backsides, they get plump. They get some junk in that trunk. <laughs> let me tell you. So yeah, they, they can definitely eat. And uh when 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 breeding, the females can be very voracious as well. Poor boys gotta watch out. So as you can see the picture at the bottom right, that's one of my males trying to breed with the females. That's also a topic I wanted to cover now that you mentioned this. Um overfeeding is really important to um know when to stop feeding uh, certain species because uh, they are so voracious that they will keep on eating whatever you throw them and eventually they, they can end up bloating and developing gut infections and all that. So it's important always oh, to- absolutely. A, a rule of thumb I would say is probably um, for adult mantises, for adult females especially, one prey item, one good size prey item every two or three days, I would say. Yeah, and if you're giving them proper water, you can probably give them once a week if, if you're giving enough water to drink, you know? So, uh, what was I going to say? But, yeah, some, some species are a little bit more prone to that. That's called what we call ooth bounding, and that's when yeah. uh, the, the eggs, yeah, the eggs get stuck. And that one result could be because of too much food. Another one could be because... They just haven't found a mate yet, and they just want to hold on for a while. So that that's that's one thing to be wary of. But Bruno's right. The females of this species, especially as they will keep eating. It's insane. Uh, if you don't plan to breed them, and you know, breeding has not been a factor in determining what is a beginner mantis because as beginners, I don't think breeding or mating them is on their minds. So that's why we didn't really include that. But this can be a challenge to breed sometimes the the bud rings because because yeah. of how much the females are are uh, vicious, but. But they're very food aggressive, so they're absolute joy to watch. Uh, you don't have to tongue feed them. Uh, they can be on the very top of an enclosure. All they just need to see is a little bit of movement and just watch them turn their head and just start the hunt. They're so fun to watch. If you go to my Jack's Mantis page, I have a few uh, videos of, of bud wings hunting on there. But they're also incredibly hardy. This is why they're you know on the list here of beginner mantises. If you want a medium sized mantis, uh, you know, and then. The sexual dimorphism is is noticeable, so you can see definitely the female is larger. The female is almost to the size where it might be considered a medium to large species, but I still consider them medium. Uh, but you can again, you can probably keep this. Uh, you definitely a male you can keep in a thirty two ounce cup. Same like the ghosts, I would put it in something a little bit bigger. Females definitely something bigger than a thirty two ounce cup. Um, maybe something like six by six by eight, something like that would be a nice size for a female. And the good thing about them is they'll explore. The, like if you put a feeder item in there, they will go after it everywhere in the enclosure. So they're pretty fun. Uh, again, very hardy. Uh, and all the, all the species I just mentioned, they can exist pretty comfortably in the wide range of room temperature and room hum humidity. I, yeah. Again, granted, you're not in those. Like if you live in Alaska and you don't have regular, you know, like, you know, air, not air conditioning, but, you know, uh, temperature regulation in your house that you have to take those kind of things into consideration yeah. but your normal room temperature room humidity all these species do Works just fine Works perfectly. yeah they do just fine as long as you give them water drink uh, regularly and you, you give them properly hydrated food items that are clean they'll do just fine nothing they don't need anything special as long as it doesn't go below 19 degrees celsius uh, i don't know how much is that in fahrenheit i can look that up real quick google's right here <laughs> Metrics, man. <laughs> We're already in it, you're saying? What? Yeah, so 66 Fahrenheit, 19 degrees, about 66 Fahrenheit. Okay, yeah. So uh, as long as it doesn't drop lower than that, they're they're just fine. Yeah. They'll do fine, and, uh, fine, they'll eat fine. So. Now, one thing concerning, and tell me what you think about this, Bruno, but one thing concerning room temperature, room humidity that I've noticed and experienced now, all these species we're talking about, they can they can thrive and do just well in those conditions. However, I do feel like having a slight variation during the day helps with, uh, even though, they, again, you can technically have light on them their entire life and they, they can survive. But I feel like when my mantises have a slight variation in temperature and light, like a day-night cycle, and you can set that. You can put your timer, you know, you turn on the lights of your room. If there's no na not, you know natural light, you can turn it on certain times of day to give that... Mm -hmm type of day-night cycle. Same thing with temps. 
uh, if it's like if you get like I'm um, speak Fahrenheit here, Bruno, but let's say you have during the day 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and if okay. you can have it drop at night to like 72, 73, uh, it's good. I think that little variation helps the mantis kind of um, regulate, have some like a cycle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As long as you, as you keep it in a, in that range, they'll do fine, and it's always good to try to mimic as closely as possible uh what nature feels like for them you know yeah, if, yeah. If you keep things too linear like for example um a constant temperature or constant source of light you know and you turn off uh i mean if, if you have a balloon like you or me if you turn off the lights too late you know after too many hours that probably affects their um behavior pattern you know and may also affect their mating patterns you know because mm -hmm. many species the males become more active searching for mates at night when the females yeah. are much calmer you know and they're releasing pheromones so that's an important thing to keep in mind as well if you're trying to go into breeding yeah and i think also most mantises i would say probably molt when it's darker uh well. given that they're very visual and a lot of patch as well at night yeah. and during early morning yeah so you know considering again they're very visual so they can they can tell when it's light or dark yeah. uh, that's actually what the three eyes in between their compound eyes are for yeah. so um they, you know i would assume also when it's darker they molt more comfortably or or easier mm -hmm. so that, that helps too and also usually when it's darker uh, especially maybe around sunrise when there's like dew everywhere it's the humidity is a little bit bumped up that could possibly why they like to molt around that time as well again it's a little bit kind of theoretical and it's a little bit of conjecture but something to think about uh so that's that's the budwing okay so uh moving on to we're gonna move on now to the large species and this is again I'm, I'm more of, yeah i'm more of a large species guy that's kind of who i am uh don't get me wrong all the other ones are great but when it comes to mantises for me yeah. the bigger the better and we got here some of the biggest ones available in the hobby, Rombadera species. The uh, of the mantis world. Was that sorry? The Godzillas of the mantis world. Yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're awesome. Now with the Rombadera species, it's one of the uh, genera that the species are a little bit different. So on the very right, you'll have a Rombadera megera. The middle is a Rombadera. Uh, sorry, the very yeah megera. In the middle is a Rombadera stali. Now, there's another species called Romadera basalis. And the reason I'm not putting that in the beginner is because they are highly food aggressive. And I never, ever wiggle my finger like this in front of a Romadera basalis. You know, so, never. Yeah. I will never make That's that mistake again. Keep your mantis stuck there for like five minutes. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, when I handle mantises, it's always the open palm. Like, I don't like to have like rogue digits running around looking yeah. like, like food items. So uh, with the wrong, yeah, that's why I kept the Robert Robertera Basalis out. It's it's a fantastic mantis. Don't get me wrong, I love them. They're actually one of my favorite. They're they have a very pretty good sized pronotum. It's pretty wide as far as Robertera go. Uh, not as wide as uh, Latra pronotum, but it's pretty wide. Um, and then, but we're gonna focus on two species here that I want to talk about. It's Robertera megera, which is the probably the biggest one in in, in terms of like mass, I think. Uh, and then Robertera stali, which usually has a more narrow shield. The genus as a whole is a mess, so who knows what I'm telling you might change later. They might change the name, but keep your eyes out for those two species for Rombadera as far as beginners go, Megera and Stali, okay? And they're commonly referred to as shield mantis, Javan, Javan shield mantis, even though not all of them are from the Java Javan area, which is Southeast Asia. It's, like I said, it's kind of a mess, but Rombadera, Stali, Rombadera, Megera, they are very large. They feed well. They have the traditional... Uh, a classical mantis look uh and then they also have these beautiful white spots on their on their wings and their green tends to be more vibrant uh than let's say the or or herdula and those pink so on they're definitely a species keep your eyes out sorry those pink on the wings are just awesome um sorry. yeah yeah and the romadera megera on the bottom side have more of more pink than the other species Very in the genus cool. so it's yeah they're they're awesome they're big they're they're aggressive um they're generally handleable as long as it's not a basalis. And again, the, it, once you learn mantis behavior, and you can kind of tell when a mantis want to be trifled with, handling becomes easier because then you know not to handle it. It's, it's that easy. Sometimes the mantis will be in a wandering mode, and you don't have to do much. You just put your hand in front of it, and it'll climb up. 
So it just yeah. depends. But for a beginner, again, this is why I'm looking at this from the from the viewpoint of a beginner. Uh, these are the raw material species you want to stick with. Do you have anything to add about them, Bruno? Um, I had previous experience with them. I kept them for. I kept uh, a species that's that was commonly referred as Romadeo valida here in Europe. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, if it was actually Basalis or, I don't know. They were labeled as valida for me. So um, they're, I mean, I think you covered mostly everything. They're, they're really versatile predators. They, they will, it's really amazing to see how they can tackle even medium history, for example. They'll just go for the kill, and their jaws are so strong that they'll even pierce through that their their armor, so as to say. Yeah, exoskeleton. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's and uh, I actually have a video on my Jax Mantis uh, page where uh, I have a Romadera basalis because they're crazy, but it's taken on an adult eastern lumbering grasshopper. And I don't know if you've seen them, Bruno. They're huge. Yeah. So and they're very well armored and everything. It just it's all awesome. it could just. It's just it's crazy. It's it's really fun to see. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, back to one more thing. So in in Europe, I think uh, Bruno, correct me if I'm wrong. You might also see uh, Lati pronotum, which is That's a Romadera with a much wider pronotum. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They have yeah. a much wider pronotum, and also a uh, new species that has been uh, I've seen some people with it is Romadera Kirby. Kirby. Mm. Kirby. I, I don't know how. To Haven't heard of it. Yeah. But yeah, it comes from Indonesia, from right, and it's a really cool Romadera species because uh, apart from the green form, you can also get a brown form. Mm, okay, interesting. Which is pretty interesting for Romaderas because they're all green, you know. It's, it's yeah, their yeah. their base color, you know. And this species can actually adapt to a, a dry leaf color, so it's pretty interesting. And also, their their pronotum have has like a slight um wavy pa pattern on the edges you know okay yeah so um it's it's a species that i would really enjoy uh adding to my collection actually uh, it's, it sounds like i would love to have it too i mean yeah, again I'm, I'm a big fan of the rombadero so that sounds awesome there's actually um there's a species here in the u.s it's pretty new it was in the hobby like many many years ago but it, it resurfaced yeah. it's called i forgot off the top of my head it was something like Tamalonica or something like that. Okay, Tamalana, Tamalonica. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, I think. And it looks it looks like a Rombadera really basalis. Sweet. Kind of kind of has that, you know, the wide pronotum. And exactly. it looks like it has the colors of a Nigomantis or a polyspelota. So that kind of marbled look. It's really cool. I hope I hope uh, I know some people who have them. I hope they uh, their breeding projects take off because they, they seem really yeah, cool. I'd love to see them yeah. more. Yeah. yeah and I'm they seem like they would be a good beginner species candidate too. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. But yeah, but that's it for Rombadera. So let's let's move on to the next. And the classic Herodula or Herodula species. These and guys have uh, yeah. You want you want to leave Bruno from here? Take it from here. For sure. Well, I've only had experience with uh Herodula venosa, the one that they call SP Golden, which I don't know if it's venosa or not. Some people say it's venosa with a yellow morph. Some people say it's not. It's considered a different species. Uh, I would like to have this clarified. But uh, I had this one and uh, Majuscula as well. Yeah. Between these two, I mean, I really love uh, the SP Golden's uh, bright yellow color you know almost like helvia color but mm -hmm. i have to say that i would definitely go with a majuscula because uh their thread display is just amazing i mean they have almost all colors they have red black um uh, purple on their underside for them um they're just amazing to keep and also a really interesting thing is that i noticed is that uh when you're when they're in the threat pose, they will also not stridulate, but they will rub their back wings with their uh, frontal legs, not the raptorials, the front legs, mm -hmm. and they'll produce uh, like a, a chirping noise, you know, to add up. I've, to I've never, I've never experienced that. That's crazy. Yeah, it's pre pretty cool. Pretty cool. I have some videos. I'll, I'll show you. It's pre pretty interesting. They're 
uh, threat mechanism. Also, um, really similar to uh, what you said, Ben, in terms of uh, care and um, feeding habits and housing, they're really aggressive mantids, and they they will not hesitate into also attacking your finger if you if you try and, and handle them when they're in their stock mode or if they're just uh, sitting and waiting for for something to come by, you know. So, uh, I mean, I, I really recommend this species. If, if you're into some action, you know, and you like to see uh, an active predator that goes after their prey and just puts on a, sh a show for you, you know, it's really interesting. Yeah. So among, among the three large species that we're going to talk about today, I, I feel like they're the least food aggressive. That doesn't mean they're not food aggressive. They're definitely, they're a go-getter, like you said, you know. Exactly. But uh, even even within these three species, which I'll talk, I'll explain. So uh, Bruno already talked about two of them. So we had the Herodula or Herodula. I, I, per, I personally like to say Herodula. How do you, how do you say it, Bruno? Uh, in Spanish, it's Herodula, you know. But oh, my God. That sounds – I want to say Herodula. I'm going to say Herodula. I mean, in English, it does definitely sound better as Herodula because it's, it's probably the way you would pronounce it better. That's yeah. what Lohit says, but you know what? I don't like it. I don't care. <laughs> and, and we'll probably understand ourselves. I'll honor Lohit. I'll just call it Harajula. That's fine. Yeah. But you have Harajula venosa, which is the uh, golden giant uh, mantis. Now, in Europe, they have the species golden. I'm assuming it's the same species as venosa. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a, there's a lot of confusion because the main picture on the left that you see here is the Harajula membranacea. Remember Nasia, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's the this to me that species of Herodula is the best Herodula species for beginners. It is the calmest large mantis I have ever kept, and I have kept many different individuals from different broods, from different uh, uh, bloodlines, and they all consistent. The Herodula membrana membrana sea mm -hmm. is very very calm mantis. Not calm if you're a feeder insect. But in terms of handling, again, and people know my stance on handling. I'm not a big fan of handling. You want to minimize it because it is a, uh, a a chance to stress and harm the insect. But if you do want to handle them, that is the top mantis. It's Herodula, uh, or Herodula membranacea. Mm -hmm. The venosa are probably the spaziest in my experience of all those three. I personally love them because I, anytime a, a mantis is uh, it has a lot of attitude or is aggressive or spazzy, except for uh, Galinthius amina, which are a little bit too spazzy for me, but I, I kind of like that. So that's why I like the Her uh, Herodula venosa. Uh, the females are the only ones that come in that bright yellow. And it is a yellow that you will see rarely on other mantises. So mm -hmm. the first one that I mentioned, the Her Herodula membranacea, the main one, and that one actually gets the biggest of those three. That one comes in green, comes in like a tan, even brown. Uh, whereas the Her Herodula venosa come, the females can come in full green, to that full, beautiful gold and yellow, and anywhere in between with the mix. Males are always mm. full green. Yeah, uh, I've seen even um, pastel colored, like some sa salmon colored um, venosas, which are yeah. absolutely stunning. Yeah, I think yeah, I think I've seen some of those. It's like a it's like a mix with pink and uh, and that golden yeah, yellow yeah. in there. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there's, there's something when you look at a, a adult female venosa in that picture, they're just so charismatic. It's insane. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and I, a lot of you know who Lohit is. Me and Lohit always would argue, like, you know, for me, the Venosa was the most beautiful Herodula. But over time, I have to agree with Bruno, too, now, the, the Majuscula or the giant rainforest uh, mantis, yeah. it is in the green. And again, Bruno, tell me what you think. The green on the Majuscula is not the same as the green on the it's just Membrana. Like, it's, it's like a, more a vibrant. Green, you know, it's it's just... It stands out. It looks like it, somebody painted it with a highlighter. You know. Yeah, exactly. It's it's it's, it's, so it's something. Cool. If you haven't had Majuscula, yeah. you definitely should. You know, and in terms of feeding response, they're all basically the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the Venosa, the yellow golden giants, are going to be the spaziest. The giant reinforced a little bit less so, and the chillest ones are going to be the Herodula membranacea. Again, mm -hmm. these are these are the staple beginner mantises when you come to large mantises. Bruno, you got anything else to add for that? Uh, I think we've covered pretty much everything. Uh, well, I would just want to add, um, if, if you're looking into breeding these species, uh, both Hyrodula species and uh, Romadera species, 
you got to keep in mind that um, they're really aggressive as females. So uh, keep them really well fed. And once they have a few meals on them after adult, um, then you can start to think about introducing the male. You know? If in the, in the case that you want to have less risk of losing the male, you know? But yeah, other than that, I think um, it's pretty much all covered up. Yeah, and then uh, and Bruno, you covered this before. If you don't plan on mating your female adult mantis, don't feed them much. You know, the only time I, I feed them extra is um, when I'm about to breed them or they're in the process. I'm trying to breed them and I want the male to have a distraction that works for him. So sorry, I got this fruit fly flying around me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that's, you know, no, don't don't worry. Usually when you look at the underside of the abdomen, you have those abdominal abdominal plates and there's a membrane that shows once it starts getting full. Once you start seeing that membrane, usually black and herodula. Yeah. Once you start seeing that, when you can kind of see it in one of the pictures, mm -hmm. that's it. The mantis doesn't need to eat more than that. So that's a good indicator for you if you're feeding yeah. your adult female mantis and you don't want it to get oothbound and you have no plans on breeding it. Just look for that little membrane, that black membrane that shows between the segments when it's eating, and you'll know when to stop. Okay, so we're going to move to our last uh, best beginner species for for the large category. And uh, Bruno is going to take this, and it is the Sphodromantis gyna. Okay. Bruno, take it from here. Sure. Uh, personally, I actually never had any experience with Sphodromantis. Uh, so I don't really have... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Bruno. I might have confused that. So I was supposed to take it from yeah. here. No worries. But, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a species that I... The, well, there are some species of Sphodromantis that are really interesting. To have they have uh, different colorations than normal spodromantis. Like for example, spodromantis aria. Uh, it, it has been around the hobby recently. I mean, I've seen it recently, and uh, they're just for me. They're just the prettiest uh, spodromantis out there. Their color, yeah. their colors are just amazing. They they can even have a different body color than their eye color. You know. Like with with a brownish body color and green eyes, you know. So it's it's pretty interesting. Yeah, and I love this genus because it is. There's a lot of species in this genus, so you can mess around with the giant African genus and just try different a lot of a lot of different species. They come in like just Bruno just mentioned. They come in different colors. Uh, what we're used to here in the U.S. are two main species, and that's Sphodromantis lineola and Gastrica. And mm -hmm. that genus is also a mess. And a lot of times people can't differentiate between the two. So a lot of times you'll see them being offered as just Sphodromantis species or Sphodromantis CF lineola. CF is just basically a designation that means we think to our best guess that it's this species. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but this is probably the most aggressive large species here, like right after Rambadera. Mm -hmm. uh, they are highly, way more than Herodula, again, in my experience. Uh, mm -hmm. I've kept Lignola, Gastrica, I think, <laughs> uh, Viridis, uh, which is on the right side of this picture by Lisa van der Veen. They're beautiful. Uh, here in southern Spain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and they're becoming more common now here in the U.S., Bruno, So, which is awesome because I actually just had a female lay a fertile ooth, hopefully. Awesome. Well, Great. I'm thinking it's fertile. She, she, got, she made it well, so. But I, but I, I mean, like, uh, in wild states, we have, we have them in southern Spain. Yeah. Like in the wild, so it's pretty interesting because I, I, a few years back, I didn't know about that, and you know, I, uh, I thought Sp uh, Spodorantis, that that's an African genus, you know, and I would never see it present in Europe. You know? so yeah, I mean, again, geographically speaking, it, it wouldn't be surprising if, you know, for yeah. example, let's say a a shipping container from from Libya, you know, Morocco, Syria, yeah. made it to the port somewhere on in, uh, in southern yeah. Spain, you know. And it had an Uthaka on it, and it had. So, I mean, it's 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 definitely within the, the realm of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So, but they're absolutely beautiful. And there's nothing really I can say about the Sphodromantis that I can't say for the Herodula. They're great beginner species. They're pretty handleable as well. Not as good as the Herodula, but pretty handleable. Mm -hmm. uh, they are fantastic hunters. They are super aggressive. You, again, very hardy. 
you can't go wrong with them. So if you see, if you're looking for a beginner mantis and you want a large one and you want to have a good feeding response, this is a fantastic species. Uh, Bruno, do you have anything else to add to that? Uh, I also wanted to add, uh, again, talking about uh, breeding aspects, uh, these guys, uh, both Rombodera and uh, Spodermantis and also Haraja, yeah. these guys explode with babies, you know? So <laughs> with one pair, you can get uh, maybe the female lays around five, six hooves. What do you think, Ben? Around that quantity? Five, it, six hooves, maybe? My, my Venosa is easily laid with one pairing, easily four hooves. And okay. uh, yeah, and each... Just uh, 100 plus, yeah, 100 minimum, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, the, <laughs> naturally, any species that has a very high hatch rate almost inevitably has high die off rate, and they also tend to be uh, more cannibalistic than others. Ge again, this is all generally speaking, mm -hmm. that's why I noticed with, with high hatch rate species. So, mm -hmm. uh, I just had a macromantis ooth hatch, I, I posted it to my I'm not kidding, is the 300 plus species, and macromantis is a massive. Massive mantis, so they're, they're, it's yeah. These these large mantises for the, you know they, they tend to hatch uh, the ones that we just mentioned. They hatch a lot of nymphs, so it's funny so that them be, be ready. Uh, yeah, it's, it's funny that uh, really large mantises uh, produce uh, such tiny nymphs, you know. And for example, uh, I don't know ghost mantises. They they're like a, a medium size, medium to small size mantis, and yeah. they produce around like twenty to maximum forty plus individuals yeah. in, in an oof, you know, and they're already uh, a good size, you know. And yeah, they're they, not a, like a, a ghost mantis nymph at first instar is not that small. Yeah. Yeah, or for example, talking about more advanced species, Ceratocrania. Mm -hmm. The I call them the Malaysian ghost mantis. They, these mm -hmm. guys, they, they just, they're, they're almost uh, one centimeter in, in length, like this big. I don't know how much it is in. in as, as first instar? Yeah, as first instar. Oh, wow. They're absolutely huge, you know? They're really long, so I guess that makes up. Yeah. Point. Yeah, the, the, lo the long species tend to be like that for sure. But, like, mm -hmm. for example, uh, Duraplatus, you know, I know we're moving a little bit away from the topic, yeah, but exactly. is out, Duraplatus is actually be a beginner plus species. So mm -hmm. that would be not a bad one, but like the mm -hmm. Deraplatus labata, Deraplatus truncata have mm -hmm. probably the largest first instar nymphs I've ever seen. Now yeah, they're yeah. not a small species, but they're they're like on the smaller spectrum of the larger ones, you know. And yet they have the largest nymphs, which is kind of and weird. So, but they're, they're first yeah, they can they can probably take house flies at first instar. Yeah, 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 totally. So that's all we had, folks, for beginner mantises. Uh, you know, that, these are the species that me and Bruno talked and felt like really you can't go wrong with if you want to try out the hobby or if you want to learn more about, you know, different species. Uh, something I always uh, recommend to everybody when you want to get into the hobby, get more than one nymph. The reason is, you know, because the most important thing about learning mantis keeping and becoming good at it is learning the behaviors you need to watch out for, particularly pre-molt behavior. So you want to know when your mantis is about to molt so you don't disturb it and harm it during that critical period. And if you have more than one nymph, you have a reference point. You can say, hmm, this nymph is not acting like the other one that I have. Something's off. Whereas if you only have one, you don't have a frame of reference if you don't have that experience. So, so yeah. Plus, I, I wanted to add as well that uh, if you only get one nymph, you're going to regret it. I mean, <laughs> you're going to enjoy it so much that you're going to want a couple more. Yeah, you you're gonna hit, you're gonna hit yourself later because like why don't I just get more and it's yeah. it's just you're wasting your time just get more than one okay uh, I, I promise you me and Bruno will give our words that's that's how it is okay so uh, what we'll do now is we will go to questions and uh, if anybody has any questions please now is the time put them in the chat below uh, Bruno can you see the questions in our, on our restream section or no. Can you see the um, chat? Yeah, the, the chat where people are writing yeah. stuff. You can see it. Yeah. It's here. Okay, cool. So, yeah, folks, just go ahead and type your questions in there. Yeah. And uh, we'd be happy to answer them. In the meantime, until some questions come up, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some, um, you know, are, th are there any species, Bruno, that you're looking forward to getting soon? Or 
Um, actually, yes, but it's it's a species that I had previously, but I I just uh, stopped uh, breeding with uh, the orchid mantises. I want to get back to these because they are oh, just okay. amazing, amazing. I would say it's an intermediate species. What do you think? Ben? Orchids, I would put. Maybe I'm being too. Oh, that's always been a little bit. That that's a controversial one. That's yeah. for sure. Regardless of what you're gonna say or I'm gonna say, you're gonna get a lot of people like, no, 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 it's this or that or whatever. I would say it's definitely beginner plus to intermediate. Okay. Yeah. They're not. They're they're a lot hardier than people think, personally. Yeah. But they're not necessarily. Think, oh, orchid mantis. They need a lot of like specific. No, they don't. No. <laughs> They, they're pretty resilient and they'll adapt fairly well, you know, but they, they do need a, a, some min, minimums, you know, like for yeah. example, don't go below 70% humidity or don't go below like uh, 22 degrees Celsius, which I, I don't know how much is that in, in Fahrenheit, but yeah. Well, one thing I always tell people, if you cannot provide the, uh, yeah. The, the proper humidity, you can easily just give it more water to drink. That's always a, a tactic that you should that people should be aware of. So, again, um, always give them extra water. So in case you can't meet that humidity requirement, it's more work, but it's doable. Obviously, you want to give it the, the, the ideal parameters, but if you can't reach that with, with low humidity conditions, just give them more water to drink, and they should be fine. So. Okay, I see a question here. Uh, what enclosures should I put my Harajil venosa in when they reach their final insights? I mean, the rule of thumb, as Ben said, is uh, three times their height and twice uh, their... Their length, yeah, in, in their, width and depth, yeah. Exactly, that's it. So you want to keep them in a tall enclosure. That, that's really important to, to keep in mind because they like to hang on to uh, top surfaces. So yeah, that's that's a rule of thumb for you to keep in mind. I don't know if you have anything else to add then to that question. No, uh, again, and I mean, Bruno, I'm sure you'll understand this, like, because we keep so many, to us, just simple is better, you know? That doesn't mean we don't have beautiful enclosures. If you look behind me, I have some very nice terrariums and stuff, mm -hmm. but, for the most part, especially if you're a beginner, you don't you want to minimize the margin of error. Yeah. Keep it simple. They don't need anything special. It's for your eyes you think that you need, not for them. So yeah. again, take this and take this cup right here and and expand it to the size necessary, and that's all they need. Yeah. Okay. Once you have more experience with them and stuff, then you yeah. can start to I don't know put them in a planted enclosure. Um, where they have all the structures they need to climb onto the walls and everything. But it's yeah. always good to start with the basics and keep things simple in the beginning so you get the hang of it. That's my opinion. Yeah. And then uh, uh, who asked that? That was Jose. So Jose, in my nicer enclosures that have foliage and plants and stuff, I, you, usually the best thing to do is put an adult in there because you don't have to worry about it molting. And having any issues exactly so until it until it hits adulthood just keep it in something very very simple as long as it has space that's all it needs a good gripping material to hang from that's it it's again so easy like the like i said before the main issue or problems you have with with mantis keeping is people not knowing the signs of when it's about to molt and they move the enclosure or move the mantis or put in a feeder insect that might bump into it while it's in that critical period it might fall and die so yeah, having that kind of yeah so that's, that's kind of what you what you want to keep an eye out for. And that's why simple enclosures help you notice those things, you know, so. Okay. Uh, there's another question here. Fantastic live stream, guys. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Really enjoyed yeah. it. I'm pairing my Dark Letters de Cicada tonight for the first time. And please. Okay. You want to start, Ben? Yeah, sure. I, I literally just posted this morning. Yeah. Of, Are you of, smiling? Uh, I, 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 I was sure you want to do that. <laughs> because I just posted this morning okay. a picture of one of my females chomping the head off one of the males. <laughs> but <laughs> so, they're actually not that hard to, well, any Duraplata species male is going to be pretty finicky uh, and, and pretty sensitive to uh, yeah. like interference. So 
This includes the Deraplaza Desicata. So what, uh, you always want to put the uh, Desicata mail in first. Uh, let it acclimate at least a few hours. Uh, turn down the lights a little bit. Uh, yeah. Generally speaking, when I've had problems reading uh, Deraplatis, I bump up the temps and the humidity. I haven't had to do that all the time, but when I'm really having issues, that's what I do. But my room is like I actually have a humidifier in my room, and my room is actually pretty warm as it is, my, my, my mantis room. So usually I don't have to worry about that. But keep put the male in there, let them get comfortable, put the female somewhere where the male can see the female, keep the female busy with food, and then it's uh, it's kind of a wait and see kind of thing. You, yeah. Most deraplatis you can't really. So with with any breeding attempt, I always usually try to take the male and you know on a stick and behind the female and just be very patient and see if they'll hop on. If they don't, I, you know, yeah, just because it depends I, on the species as well. Yeah, it depends on species, yeah. but but I also but sometimes you get lucky, Bruno. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, so, yeah. yeah, you get lucky. And this only happens when I have time, which I don't have a lot of time, free time. <laughs> so when I have some free time and it's a species I really I try to introduce the male. If it doesn't work, it's fine. I'll make the most adequate uh, environment for them to mate, and I'll leave them be. Uh, again, depending on species. Some species, you don't want to leave them be because you'll almost guarantee yeah. have a female eat the male. So you got to keep them, you know, keep them busy and that kind of stuff. So Three species doing that is a big no-no. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and another misconception. Well, it's not, look, many, many people breed different ways, and there's obviously some species have certain ways that they prefer, but if you've tried something and it works for some reason, because you have to understand there's a lot of things that affects an animal's behavior. It's mm -hmm. not just its species, also the conditions that you're keeping them. So the conditions that I keep a mantis in might not be the same condition that Bruno keeps a mantis in. So maybe my temp, humidity, maybe the amount of pheromones that my females are releasing are in a, in a, in a room are messing with, I don't know. So mm -hmm. you yeah. can, you know, obviously listen to people have experience and see from their take and see what works for you. Sorry, Bruno, mm -hmm. go on. No, yeah, I was just adding uh, that there are so many variables that you have to uh, try to control, you know. It's not going to always go the way you plan, you know, because um, it really depends on, for example, their environment, the light conditions, especially because uh, some males are more uh, prone to uh, jump on female and mates during the night, you know. So there's a lot of things to keep in mind. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Hannah, good luck. <laughs> I hope you're successful with them because I have I have three mated females and they're dropping ooths uh, kind of regularly, but they don't they don't always hatch and they don't they don't hatch much. So, and as many people who have seen my live streams know already, that I absolutely love Deraplatis desicata. It is my currently my favorite mantis, uh, just because I I haven't seen anything that even compares to it. <laughs> you too, Bruno. No, I, I'm saying I remember you told me that. that yeah, yeah, definitely. Their plus this guy is my favorite mantis. It's just they're awesome. Uh, I mean that that yeah. uh, threat display is just amazing. I just it's like, not just that. It's like especially the females. They have like an like an old world vibe to them. They they feel like they come from the old forest. Yeah, you know, they're like they're like a forest spirit. What I what I noticed is that um, if you keep them in a really wide enclosure as adults. Um, and with a lot of leaf litter, they'll actually prefer to hang out on the leaf litter and uh, blend into that leaf litter, you know. I've noticed many times that if you keep them there in the enclosure I, I just uh, told you, if they see you come by or something, they'll just crouch, you know, mm -hmm. in a really cool fashion and just spread their legs out, you know, and try to look as much as a dead leaf as possible. You know? No, it's you're absolutely really right. right. Like Deraplatus is one of the few species that they hang from anywhere, you know, from the yeah. side, from the bottom, you know, they don't care. So, which makes and, uh, they, they will tackle most, mostly like ground dwelling creatures, you know? Yeah, I, I've noticed from especially Desicata because they're the largest of the Deraplatus that I'm aware of. They, like, I don't even feed them blue bottle flies. It's pointless. They don't, I don't think they even see that, like, they don't even register as a prey item. So yeah, well, they're just too small. They, they, notice, they, they, they also notice vibrations, you know, on, on the leaves around them, you know. If something yeah. touches, slightly touches or brushes their leg, they instantly turn around and just go after it, you know. Yeah, they're fantastic. But yeah, but that that's why I don't use I don't use flies with them. Yeah. Unless it's a big flying insect, like I've had some wasps, dragonflies, stuff like that I can use. But mm -hmm. if it's small, 
you know, I don't think you're even going to notice it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but I think it's going to become a meme soon that every last year, my mom, I'm going to have to go on and on about their plot of Sessicata. So <laughs> I'm going to stop. Yeah, I think yeah, people yeah. have heard enough about him. But uh, we had here another question. Um, yeah. What about the orchid mantis that makes it less of a beginner species? Uh, tips on ensuring the adult mold goes smoothly well. Uh, I mean, you want to take it, Bruno? You want to take it from here? Sure. Um, my experience with um, molting uh, of, of uh, orchid mantises is, is that if you see them in pre-molt, you don't want to spray them uh, directly because um, what I noticed is that if you spray them just before they're molting, they'll uh, usually mismolt. You know, they'll develop crippled wings. You know, I don't know if it's been just a coincidence, but it has happened to me many times. So what I try to do is when I see a praying mantis in pre molt, especially mantises that need a lot of humidity, like Hymenopus or or Helvia or uh, uh, Theopropus. Um, I keep them with a thick substrate of uh, coconut fiber or, I mean, if, if you don't have coconut fiber, you can also use paper, really soaked, wet paper towels, and that will help with um, overall humidity. I mean, you have to keep in mind that this is only during the process the, of, of molting, you know, just before that, because uh, you want to keep most mantises in well-ventilated enclosures, you know. So uh, I think personally that if you keep your uh, Himenopus, uh in a uh, like not as ventilated enclosure and uh, with a high relative humidity, uh, it, it will do good. It will do good in its final mold. Especially don't don't, um, don't spray it before molting. That's my personal experience. Yeah. So if you have I think uh, yeah, because I think Bruno, an important thing to know is so obviously people know that when a mantis is about to molt, a little bit higher humidity helps it come out of its you know if it's exoskeleton, but at the yeah. same time it has to dry when it's coming out. You know, so That's, if you just if it's yeah if it's if it's coming out and you're just spraying it is drenched with water. It's not getting able to dry properly, so that could be what's interfering. So that's why uh, most of the time, if you, and again we've talked about this many times in this group, internal hydration is the most important part. So it doesn't matter how humid the enclosure is, if your mantis has not been drinking and eating fe fe feeder items that are properly hydrated enough, it's most likely going to miss mold. That's the most important thing. That's and important. then second comes the uh, humidity. So make sure you're feeding your mantis as well. So in terms of what can you do to ensure the adult mold goes smoothly. Make sure it's eating well, uh, and by by gut loaded, I don't mean it has to be like calcium or anything. Just make sure your feeders are you know, are eating well with highly uh, with with a food that has high water content. Okay, mm -hmm. so keep yeah. that in mind when you're when you're working yeah. with uh, with orchids. Uh, in terms of what makes them less of a beginner species, uh, they are a little bit more generally. Again, generally speaking, most flower species are more susceptible susceptible to uh, bacteria than others, uh, yeah. you know, anything from the, uh, man, I have a problem pronouncing this, Hymenopodae. Hymenopodae. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So the, again, the flower, flower species. So they're, they're always a little bit more uh, susceptible to bacterial infections. So that's why the, the orchid mantis needs high humidity. Well, it doesn't need it. It prefers high humidity and it needs good ventilation. And obviously that's a hard trade-off to do, right? With more ventilation, it's harder to keep high humidity. So that's why Focus on giving them enough water to drink and make sure their feeders have uh, uh, enough to drink as well. So that's that's, that's I guess basically it. I I believe like the, the key to perfect mantis keeping is well good ventilation and good humidity. Fair enough. You know? Yeah, and, and that's very hard to do, right? Yeah, it's it's hard, to do, you know, but it, um, yeah. it's possible if if you keep a few things in mind. Uh, thick layer of substrate that is um, uh, fairly humid. I wouldn't say like completely overwhelmed with water, you know, but uh, and also uh, side uh, vent and a top vent, especially a top vent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, that's, 
Yeah, yeah, like I said, uh, orchids are not that hard. They're, I really don't think they're that hard. Again, they're not, I wouldn't say they're a completely beginner, but beginner plus for sure. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, uh, that's all I have really for orchids, Bruno. I don't know if you want to add anything on top of that. Nothing else, yeah. Okay. And then I think uh, we'll just take this as the last question because uh, Peter, cool. Peter, it was good having you, man. Sorry, I know it's late, but uh, we'll take this last question from JR Insects. Roughly how old can Brancisca males get? I don't know because I've never kept them. So. Uh, <laughs> From my experience, um, I would say it's probably like a truncata male um, lifespan. I would say maybe around a month and a half, maximum two. You know, because usually they're they're usually the, the smaller the male is, the less they live, obviously. So, uh, for example. Desicata males, they're, they're huge. And they are probably the most long lived males I've ever kept. Yeah. Uh, they've been yeah. for four, five months, you know, four months. Oh, four six months, months easily adult. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my truncata males can, can go three to four months usually as an adult. No yeah. Problem, so. crazy. Yeah. Uh, but if I, if I was to, if somebody gave me Branciscia, just looking at it and understanding its habitat that it comes from, I would basically treat it like a deroplatus. That's that would be yeah. my assumption. Yeah. So, which I would love to have. If you have Brancisca, send them to me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to breed these. Uh, I currently need a male because apparently my male didn't do a good job with my two females. So I I, I got oaths, but they're not hatching. So no. Oh, yeah. Them. Yeah. Something yeah. about these deadlift species, man. Sometimes they just lay oaths and it's like, nah, I don't feel like giving you yeah. a good one. So. <laughs> but okay uh Bruno, unless you have anything else to add brother uh i think we did a pretty good job uh, it's gone a little bit longer than i anticipated but that means it's good we're having a good time uh but good thing about the stream is that it saves to the group you can ask questions later and we can chime in later so if you have any questions you can still post them down below uh thank you for watching uh thank you again bruno for joining us again i, mm -hmm. you know, I was thank when you. i was thinking about people who do this with you're literally one of the first people to come up to mind so I want to thank you for uh, for agreeing to do this. I know you're a. Really appreciate it. You say you're an introvert, but I think you you do uh, some yeah, people a favor showing that pretty face of yours. <laughs> but yeah, once once I get the go the thing going, it, it's yeah. just fun, you know. Okay, don't forget, guys, to check check Bruno out and let me bug you at let me bug you. The Instagram link should be in the post. Let me double check, but it, I definitely put it in there. Check him out. Uh, he's he promises he's gonna make more. of Facebook content. Yeah. So you promise you're going to, you're going to make more of an effort to be yeah, on, on Facebook. I'm, I'm definitely going to be more on Facebook because I, I, I see there's like such a big community that I'm missing on, you know? So yeah. I'm definitely open to that. All right. Well, thank you everybody. Uh, there thank will you. be more to come as usual. So uh, thank you for, for stopping by. We're going to have more live streams concerning this topic. So I'm, I'm thinking about doing a beginner plus live stream. For you know, Mantis is our beginner plus. Uh, I would love to do it with Bruno again, but you know, I want to try other breeders as well. No offense, Bruno. Yeah, we love you, man. But, <laughs> so, but yeah, so that's it. That's all I have. Thank you again for watching. And, and then Bruno, do you have any last words? I'll let you close out. Do you have any last words, Bruno? I'll let you close out. No, I just said that I'm really excited to see other people featured here. Okay. We're really looking forward to that. So, all right. Much love. Thank right. you. Thank you very much, man. Talk to you soon.